Ramblings podcast. My name is Nicole and I'm coming to you today from the central Willamette Valley in Western Oregon where I live with my husband and my one-year-old son and currently my in-laws as my husband and I are currently on our first home buying journey. This is a knitting and spinning uh, podcast though I do also talk about farm life as I am one of the shepherds at Cover Bridge Farm. Today's episode is mainly focused on knitting. I haven't done any spinning and I talked a little bit about this last um, time that I haven't really been feeling inspired with my spinning or almost at a roadblock where I'm not sure what to spin next. I have lots of fiber in my stash to work through but I don't really have projects picked out and I'm starting to realize that I like to spin for projects or have at least a loose idea of what sort of project I'm spinning for. That way I can tailor weight of yarn, um, plies, all the little details to make my own custom yarn. Um, so we're just talking knitting today. And I really, really thought I was going to have a finished object to share with you, but I'm just shy. I'll probably have it finished in the next couple days, but I just have a couple things to share with you in today's episode. Um, so I guess let's jump right in. Um, first, I hope you all have been enjoying your week or last two weeks since I last spoke to you. It has been beautiful here in the Pacific Northwest. We finally are on a cool down. Our summer has been very, very hot this year and it finally has fallen into the 70s, low 80s range. Um, the summer we have been sitting in the high 90s and had lots of days that were 100 plus, which is really uncommon for where I live. Um, and today I believe it is 68 degrees and I am loving every minute of it. I am ready for fall. I am ready for all things fall related. So now let's jump into knitting. Like I said, I only have a couple things to share with you today so it should be a fairly quick episode and hopefully we won't have any fussy toddler noises at the end of the episode as I film during my son's nap. So my first project. I talked about this last week and I really don't have that much project progress to share with you today but I was really close to being done last time so I'm even closer now so this is my husband's sweater like I said I can't really fit it in frame I'm sitting against the wall today so I can't really back up anymore I have in last episode I was just short of being finished with the second sleeve and I have since finished that. I had to dye a little bit more yarn for my husband's sweater. Um, I talked about this in the last episode, but this is our some of our farm yarn that we had spun a really long time ago and it's been sitting in our stash, kind of being used for our own per personal purposes. And I decided to make a sweater for my husband out of this because he has been wanting a, he's been wanting sweaters, period. But he wanted a workhorse sweater and I thought this yarn um, would be a perfect workhorse sweater and he wouldn't have to feel too guilty <laughs> if he beats up on this sweater. So like I said, this is a Covered Bridge Farm yarn. It is a 80% Horn Dorset, Pole Dorset blend and a 20% nylon um, content yarn and originally this was a like carrot orange colored yarn and I took some um, mahogany is the name of the dye um, Cushing's mahogany is what I used and over dyed it and it gave it this kind of rust color um, I talked about this in the last episode but I tried to shove too many skeins in the pot and so some struck really dark and the ones on top obviously did not have as much dye to absorb so that's why there's this striping pattern going on um, but i when we were in the process of packing and moving i found another skein of the same colored yarn and i think it's only a partial skein but that's fine um did i not bring it up i must not have brought the skein up but um, you can see it's a little, I dyed it a little bit darker 
it wasn't intentional, but you can see here that it's a little bit darker. I don't have as much light. But like I said, I'm not being too fussy about how this sweater looks. This is supposed to be an outdoor workhorse type sweater, and I really think this sweater is going to be just that. So all I have left is to knit the ribbing collar. Um, I think that's only like an inch of that, and I'll be done. Um, I had just picked up the sleeves this morning, or <laughs> picked up the neck stitches this morning, and I have not gotten any knitting done. So, this, again, this sweater um, is the Vintagrona. I'm not really sure how to say that. Um, it's a Swedish pattern by a Swedish designer, Stein Holdgard Johansson. I'm hoping I'm saying that not too poorly. You can see right here, I did drop a stitch that I need to fix once I finish the sweater. But like I said, it's almost done. Um, and I mentioned this in the last episode, I'm really loving this sweater. It has this saddleback type of uh, shoulder, or saddle shoulder, I guess is what you'd call it, detail on the back, which is part of what I thought made the sweater, sweater so flattering. Um, so yeah, I already would be happy to knit my husband another one of this pattern if he likes it. So we will see. I hope he likes it. So that's this sweater. This will be done next episode. It will. So next is my sweater. So it's kind of a his and hers sweater today. Um, so I talked about this sweater also. Um, this kind of has been my project while I was waiting for the supplies to come to dye the last ball of yarn for my husband's sweater. So this is my nurtured sweater. And I don't know what my problem is with this pattern. It really is not a complicated pattern at all. It's very, very intuitive. And once I get on a roll, I'm on a roll with it. But I'm constantly been having little mistakes that just throw it off and I have to rip back. Um, so anyways, last episode I had only the ribbing done on the body. I have since knit all the way up to where the sleeves should be joined and it's kind of scrunched because I have it holding right now on a cable. But um, here it is. I knit an inch longer on the body length than what the pattern uh, called for. I'm okay with that. I probably would have liked another additional inch, but I, again, am playing a little bit of yarn chicken with this sweater. Um, I am using some hand spun yarn that I spun specifically for this sweater from <clears throat> roving, again, our farm yarn roving, um, Eclipse, and it was a lamps roving. But I have the terrible habit of not saving enough yarn for myself, or yarn or roving, whatever I am using um, from our personal stash. I always want to make sure our customers get to have whatever they want, so I don't tend to save enough for myself. So I'm supplementing with some of our mill spun yarn that was really uh, dark in a similar weight, um, a different shape, but I'm supplementing to make this stretch a little bit further. And who knows, I might actually have leftover hand spun, which I don't really want, but that's okay. Um, anyways, so I got to the point where I needed to join in the sleeves. So the Nurtured Sweater, which is a pattern by Andrea Mowry, she has you knit your sleeves first as a gauge swatch. And I had done that, but they had been sitting, both the sleeves had been sitting for a year and a half and they've been shuffled around from different projects bags, different parts of my room, different baskets, and they kind of, when I brought them down to attach them, they just didn't look all that nice. They looked like they had felted maybe a little bit. They were really tight when I tried them on. So I made the call to rip back and re-knit the sleeves. And so that's where I'm actually at now. 
and this is where again now I'm having little hiccup problems that I'm having to rip back and rip back because I'm losing stitches I don't have the right number of stitches I make a mistake in the pattern and you can obviously see it um, different things like that and I've been having that problem with this sweater all along all these just little minor things I'm off on a stitch I'm and it affects how the pattern looks or I twist the stitches um, like when I cast on I twisted um, when I connected my in the round so I've just been having all these little minor things and I don't know what it is with me and this sweater um, but I am determined to make this sweater so this is where I'm at on the sleeves I have a mistake that I've currently dealing with you can see it right there I knit two knit rows when I should have knit a knit row and a pattern um, so I got off on my pattern so I'm in the process of ripping back so this is the first sleeve that I'm re-knitting and another thing I had an issue with my previous sleeves is that I had knit them each with a singular hand spun uh, ball which I'm still just using exclusively hand spun for the sleeves um, but one sleeve was really stiff because the yarn was heavier and the other one was probably more um, had the right type of drape and so they were really off and so I decided to take those two skeins and alternate them to hopefully get more uniformed sleeves. So those are, that's my knitting. That's all I have as far as knitting. That's not a lot. So I thought I would share with you my next whip that I'm hoping to cast on um, since I am I'm gonna finish that my husband's sweater I'm going to finish it so I thought I'd show you my next pattern and I'm kind of feeling the sweaters so I decided I'm gonna cast on another sweater that's in my queue and yarn from my stash so I thought I would show you the yarn so this this is the pattern or the yarn that I'm gonna use and you can see how drastically different these two are. These are supposed to be the same colorway, um, which the light here is blowing them out. They almost have more of a red hue, which I, I think they're both warm tone purples, um, but they also look quite drastically different. So I'm going to be alternating skeins on these. So this is I, the pattern I'm going to be knitting and hopefully casting on here. Once I finish my husband's sweater, and since I'm such a monogamous knitter, I'm probably going to wait until I finish my sweater, which once I get on a roll with this, I think will happen fairly quickly. So I am going to cast on Z the Zweig sweater by Caitlin Hunter, and I have wanted to cast on this sweater forever. And originally I thought I was going to cast on a solid Zweig sweater, um, so all one color instead of the two colors that the pattern originally um, calls for. But um, a couple years back at the Fatland Fiber Festival, which is a little fiber festival in our town, um, Christina of Teal Torch Knits came and she brought some beautiful yarn and these two skeins, again incredibly, the color is just not right. Um, even that's not right. Anyways, these two colors were sitting right next to each other in a basket and instantly when I saw them, it just spoke to me that this was a Zweig sweater. And these colors are actually kind of out of my comfort zone. This is not typically something that I would knit or dress myself in, but it just spoke to me. And maybe if I enjoy the pattern, I will make myself a more rustic and solid colored version but these are going to be my swag sweater and so originally i had picked out i don't know how many skeins of the original color uh or for the main body so this is the main body color and then i realized i didn't have enough <laughs> and ironically my mom had also purchased these same colors so clearly we have similar taste um so we both decided we needed some more. So we asked Christina if she had any more, and she didn't, but she offered to dye some more. So these are two different color lots, and it's really drastic, especially 
looking at the camera. Um, that's a little bit better. <laughs> and maybe a little bit more realistic anyways i would have loved them to all be this solid color but it's okay it was very sweet of her to dye us some more and i'm going to alternate so mine's probably going to have a more variegated look on the body but that's okay i'm really excited to cast this on and get these out of my um, stash they've been sitting there since 2019 so they're ready to be cast on and i wish you could see oh there you go so this is going to be the second color that is on the yoke of the sweater and you can see it's a speckled blue and purple there's bits of yellow um, so these again are from teal torch knits um, she's an indie dyer in portland and the dark purple is called high queen margot and this is on her teal torch knit dk which is 75 percent Superwash Merino and 25% Nylon. And I don't use Superwash very often. Um, so this will be a little different for me. A little break from my more rustic yarns. But again, I'm excited to see this sweater come together. And then this, um, the contrast color that's the speckled yarn is called Dangerously Happy. So this is my two, um, or my next project. So I'm really looking forward to casting on, um, doing a swatch and casting on and seeing what will happen. So this, you'll be seeing a lot of this sweater in the future. Yes, like I said, I'm a monogamous knitter. This will probably be my main whip for uh, knitting. So with that being said, that's all the fiber content I have. Um, not a lot, but for anyone who is interested in farm sheep life, um, I'm going to sign off here um, and say goodbye now, but I'm going to, at the end of this, insert a more vlog style, we'll see what it actually ends up being, um, clip of giving you an update of the farm and where everything is at. Uh, what's happening on the farm, life on the farm, farming um, and shepherding is a very seasonal activity. So we are currently stepping into breeding season um, now that the days have cooled and we are starting to think forward to the spring and lamps. So if you are interested in sticking around and watching that, that's going to play after here. Um, but if not, um, I will see you hopefully in two weeks. And I hope you enjoy all your crafting and making, um, and I will see you next time. There is a change in the air, hinting at the coming arrival of the new season. The flock senses it too. For the last month, the rams, who have been living a life of luxury, have become restless, fighting amongst themselves and asserting their dominance. A good sign that the ewes are beginning to cycle. Our Romneys, as with most sheep breeds, are very much tied to the seasons. Most ewes will not conceive until the days have begun to shorten and cool. It's with this shift that the rams have joined the ewes and breeding season has begun. I've got Hugo here today, and he is our natural colored Romney Ram. He is going to help me talk to you about one of the important tools that we use during breeding season and why it's so important and helpful to us. So this is a marking harness, and I'm going to be replacing Hugo's marking harness right now. Um, his other one broke, and so it was no longer uh, correctly sitting on him. So this is a marking harness. It holds a crayon like so and the crayon sits on the ram's chest and is strapped on to him securely so it's not going nowhere he's not getting tangled up but when he breeds a ewe the color transfers to the ewe's backside and that lets us know that the ewe has been bred so there's several reasons why this is such a helpful and important tool to us as shepherds um, different shepherd 
operations work different ways. Some of them don't use all these reasons um, for using a crown. But one of the first and most important reasons we use the crown is to let us know if our ram is working. If we're not getting any marks, we know that the ram's not working for some reason. Um, this could be a health problem, he's hurt in some way, or he's not doing his job. So that's really important. So we, as users are being marked, we know our ram is working. We also change the crayons out on these guys every 16 days. A used fertile cycle is 16 days long approximately. And so we change out the colors every 16 days to know if there are remarks. So a ewe, that we are currently in the first breeding cycle of, on our farm. So all the ewes are being marked with red for Hugo. We'll swap out a different color. Let's say we switch him to blue. And then if we know if any of those ewes who marked red in the first place, remark blue, we know that they didn't have a successful breed the first time. If we change it out a third time, we usually keep the ram in for three breeding cycles. We definitely sometimes do longer, but three cycles really is a good insurance for us. Um, it lets anyone who is remarked or didn't cycle the first time around have a chance to cycle again. So if we change them now to, from blue to green and that same you remarks, we know that maybe she has a fertility problem. Or if he's marking all the flock over and over again, maybe he has a fertility problem. And so then we know that maybe we need to put a different ram in to do cleanup duty. So that's one of the first and most important reasons for using a marking harness. A second that we like to use on the farm, and not all farms do this, but we can write down the exact day that the ewe has been bred. And this helps us predict when ewes are going to be lambing. This is really helpful for us as farming is not our first jobs. So we all have off the farm's jobs. And so this really helps us know who to look for and make sure uh, is there or not there. So that is really helpful. So by knowing the conception date, we can figure out how many days a use gestation period is 145. It can be a little bit less, but 145 to 150 two days approximately. Um, you can have a little bit of variation within that range, um, but that is the average. So that you can predict from then when the birth date of the lamb is going to be. So those are two really important, I guess almost three important ways that the marking harness helps us as shepherds. So Hugo's getting a little impatient with me, so we're going to go ahead and put the, the harness on him. So the harness, like I said, it sits, the crayon sits on the brisket and these straps go up over the neck and these straps on the bottom go under the back legs. And it's really important when we put the harness on that we are not putting it on too tight where it will start chafing in his flanks here, but we also want it tight enough that we're getting good marks and that he's not getting tangled up in his harness. All the straps buckle into each other and can be adjusted accordingly. So one of these harnesses, you don't have to buy a special sized harness for the ram unless you have a breed like a primitive breed that is going to be much smaller. So you can see, and it's really important we make sure everything is not twisted and that it's not too tight on these flanks because the flanks here, both the front and the back, do not have wool coverage. So they're really gonna be more sensitive to chafing if and becoming raw and sore. And if the ram becomes raw and sore in his legs, he's not gonna wanna walk, he's not gonna wanna eat, and he's definitely not going to want to breed any use.
And so if we have any long tails like this, I just like to fold them up and tuck them under the straps. Like so, just so they don't get caught in anything. And so now I'm going to check to make sure it's tight, but not too tight. And if I think I want to tighten in certain spots, I can. And now Hugo is ready to go back out with the girls.